Welcome to Bible 325, the life, ministry, and teaching of Jesus Christ. I am your professor, uh, Shannon Cockrell. Uh, now we're looking into Module 3, uh, Lesson 4, entitled The Temptation of Christ, uh, Impeccability versus Peccability. So if you want to pause the video and gather those notes, and go ahead and grab a pen, some paper, uh, and always uh, your Bible. Have a Bible uh, handy. Have it handy. So, we're looking at, if you want to go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 4, we're looking at the temptation of Christ, um, which was predicted in the Old Testament, which we've seen. Uh, that Christ, in which we know that Christ lived a life that was predicted in Scripture. And everything he does goes to prove that uh, Scripture is reliable, Scripture is true, Scripture is dependable. Uh, prophecy is true, prophecy is dependable. And so we're looking at the temptation of Jesus. Um, Psalm 91 uh, verses 10 through 12 is fulfilled and it's quoted by Christ when he responded to Satan's temptation. And we're going to look at the importance of the word when, whenever, whenever Satan tempted Christ, Jesus always referred back to the word um, in Psalm 91. And a lot of times we'll see that he's quoting from Deuteronomy. So this is a pivotal a life-changing moment, event, in the life and in the mission of Jesus. So up until this point, if you look at Matthew 3, um, John the Baptist, the, the spotlight was on John the Baptist, and now it's starting to shift into the ministry of Christ. The ministry of John the Baptist is starting to wind down, and now we're about to see the explosion of ministry, the inauguration of min of Christ's ministry. Um, so this event occurs right after he's baptized by John the Baptist. So Christ is tempted after he hears the loving and assuring words of his heavenly father. Uh, Matthew 3, 17, and a voice from heaven. So now Christ, John the Baptist, and all these thousands of people are hearing God speak audibly. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Before Jesus did any miracles, before Jesus taught, before Jesus healed, he was loved by God. So Matthew 4 begins with some with strange words. Look at verse uh, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, this Greek word here for led is anago. Anago. A N A G O, anago or anago. Anago means to lead up. Ano, ana means up. Ago means to lead. So he's leading up to bring out, to launch into the wilderness. Now notice, it's the Holy Spirit that's driving Christ out uh, into the wilderness. Uh, yeah, then after these things, uh, Christ was being led. He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be handed over, to be tempted by the devil, the diabolos, by the devil. Now, who are the characters in this story? We see the Holy Spirit. He's the one who's doing the driving. We see Jesus, we see Satan, the tempter, and then we're going to see uh, the angels. So let's read 
And you can read this on pause the video and read Matthew 4, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 4. Uh, just listen to these words. Then Jesus, led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. So this shows the humanity of Christ. He was hungry. And the tempter came, Satan, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, in the Greek, Satan is use, he's using the form of a question, uh, a clause, which means, If you are, and I know you are. So it's not that he's doubting who Christ is. Command these stones that they become bread. But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they shall bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came, and they began to minister to him. So now we see this strange story. Let's, let's dive in. So temptation is an enticement to act contrary to God's will. And this is exactly what Satan was trying to get Jesus to do in every situation and what he's going to do with us. He wants us to act wrongly, contrary, in rebellion to what God's revealed will is. Where do you find God's will? You find God's will in his word. In these 66 books of the Bible, this right here, this is where you find God's will. You have to dig into it. You have to study it. You have to pray. You have to obey scripture. And that's what we teach here at Austin. You get in this book. You study this book. You eat this book. You breathe this book. You live this book. So the timing is also significant because Satan waited until Jesus was weak. Jesus is coming down off of this emotional high, this spiritual high. His father has proclaimed his love for him publicly. He's just been baptized. He's fulfilling all righteousness. Now he goes into the desert. Now think about it. He's in the desert 40 days and 40 nights where the desert is extremely hot in the day, extremely cold at night. Jesus didn't just step in the desert during the day and step back out. No, he was in the desert, ace in the Greek word there. He's into the middle of the desert. There's wild animals. Uh, there's, there's no food. There's no water. There's no people to help him. He's in the desert. He is physically weak and drained. And that's why we have to be careful because that's when Satan is going to come to tempt you. Spiritually when you're weak, physically when you're weak emotionally drained, you're tired, that's when Satan's going to come and attack you. That's when we have to be on our guard. Now, could Jesus have sinned? This is known in theology as the impeccability of Christ. The impeccability of Christ. The no sin of Christ, the, the no sinlessness of Christ. Christ couldn't sin. Now, Dr. Charles Ryrie, in his uh, great um, book on theology, says 
Sinlessness in our Lord means that he never did anything that displeased God. Think about that. When we say Christ was sinless, Christ never did, thought, said, saw anything that displeased his Father. That right there should challenge us to want to be perfect. We can't be perfect, but we want to live our lives glorifying God. Uh, nothing he did violated the Mosaic Law and in any way failed to show in his life the glory of God. Everything Jesus did constantly shone the light on God. It broadcasted God. It put the spotlight on God. The scriptures definitely teach that Jesus was sinless. He was first announced a holy child in Luke chapter 1. Uh, his enemies could not show that he was a sinner. There was no record of Jesus ever offering a sacrifice as many times as he went to the temple. Think about that. Nowhere in scripture does it show that Jesus offered a sacrifice when he went to the temple. This silence speaks of the fact that he did not need to do so because he was without sin. Ryrie goes on to say that Paul said Jesus knew no sin at any time. There was no deceit found in his mouth. He was the perfect, holy, spotless, sinless, blameless Lamb of God. He was absolute perfection. So now, a lot of uh, theologians debate on whether Christ was... They, they agree that he was sinless. But they don't agree on the fact of whether he could have sinned or he could not have sinned. So that's the debate we're going to jump in on and look at a little bit. So the concept that Jesus could not have sinned is called impeccability. Non possess pecar. Jesus did not possess any sin. The concept that he could have is called peccability. Possess non pecar. Jesus could have sinned. And so this is what we're going to look at. So the relationship of testing to the peccability and impeccability. So the debate as to whether Christ was peccable or impeccable is linked to his temptation. So those who hold to the peccability that Christ could have sinned, they believe that his temptations were not real. And therefore, Jesus could not truly be a sympathetic high priest as Hebrews chapter 4 declares that he is. In other words, peccability, the fact that Christ could have sinned, requires a constitutional susceptibility to sin. Those who say that Christ could have sinned say that he was susceptible to sin. He could have sinned. He could trip up. Those who support impeccability point out that it relates to the union, the hypostatic union of the, the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. He was 100% divine, 100% human at the same time. So, they believe that uh, his human nature was peccable. There are some people who believe that his human flesh was peccable, but the divine person of Christ was impeccable. So there's a great theologian, Shedd, who says, It is objected to the doctrine of Christ's impeccability that is inconsistent with his temptability. A person who cannot sin cannot be tempted to sin. And that's not correct anymore than to say that because an army could not be conquered, it cannot be attacked. So, temptability depends on the constitutional uh, susceptibility, while impeccability depends on the will. Those temptations were very strong, but if his self-determination of his will was stronger than the temptations, then he couldn't have sinned. 
then he couldn't have uh, sinned. So, let's look at the nature of Christ's temptations. His tests were real. They happened. They were obviously real. And so, anything he experienced was suited to his god manness. No ordinary man would ever be tempted to try to turn stones into bread. But the God man could do it. So why would Satan tempt Jesus with something that he couldn't do? So Christ had no sin nature. And he never committed a single sin. Still, that does not mean that his humanity was impeccable. It was impeccable, though it never knew sin. But the person of God was impeccable. Impeccable. The results of his temptation. Now, as a result of Christ being tested, he can he's sensitive, he can sensitize with us, sympathize with us. He's our example. There's understanding. He can understand what we're going through. And he, and he has grace and he has power. Grace and power. So we have a high priest who can sympathize. He can be touched with what we really, because he was really tested with tests. So he, he did not sin and he could not have sinned. He was holy, innocent, undefiled, spotless. He was spotless. Now, a closing notes here on my thoughts, just to sum this all up. Uh, Jesus could not have sinned. His divine nature would not allow him to sin. The immutability of Christ, one of his attributes, proves his impeccability or his incapability of sin. Immutability means there is no change. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. The omnipotence of Christ proves him to be impeccable. The omnipotence of Christ, I'm sorry, proves him to be impeccable. He, ha he has all power, so he can control his will. He can control his self. Therefore, he cannot be tempted. And then the constitution of his person proves his impeccability. Because unlike us, he has a 100% divine nature. So, um, you know, just think on those thoughts. Uh, read those texts again. Dig into the word. But rest assured that you serve a sinless God, a sinless Savior, a holy God who could not bear to look at us because of sin, sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and for me. Jesus Christ knows what you're going through. He has been tempted. He knows what you're going to. So like Hebrews 4 tells us, whenever we're in dire straits and life is crashing in on us and pressing down on us, we can run to the throne of grace. We can run to God's throne. and There we can find grace and mercy to help us in the time of need because we serve a God. We serve a Savior who was sinless. So think about those thoughts. Meditate on the temptations of Christ. Glean the thoughts of what it means to be tempted, but also what it means to have a Savior who knows what you're going through and who loves you.